Hello. I want to share with you a new way that we can think about adding vectors together, aside from the method that we already know of uh, drawing the two vectors head to tail, and then drawing from the beginning of that vector addition diagram to the end, drawing our resultant uh, in the example here, that one's shown in black. Uh, a plus B gives us a resultant vector of C, and we could use the Pythagorean theorem we can use tangent to find uh, length and to find an angle. If we don't have a right triangle like we have here, then we can use the law of sines and the law of cosines to find the angle and the length of our resultant. But I think it's gonna be worthwhile to learn something new, a new way that we can think about representing vectors um, that can make, for the long term, can make adding them together easier. So what I can do is I can think about vector A, and vector A is one, two, three units long along the x-axis, in the positive direction along the x-axis. And so I'm going to write vector A in a new way uh, that's gonna first require me to define what I'm going to call unit vectors. Now the word unit refers to singular, refers to one. And so I'm going to define three different unit vectors, one for each axis. So I'm going to define unit vector i. Unit vector i, I'm defining that symbol there between the i and the one the three lines, that's not an equal sign, that is a definition symbol. So I is defined to have an amount of exactly one along the positive x direction. I'm going to define vector unit vector j to have an amount of exactly one in the positive y direction. And unit vector k, I'm going to define to have an amount of exactly one in the positive z direction. Now I want to talk about the little symbols that we see there, uh, the little symbols on top of the i, j, k. We've discussed before how when we write vectors, like if I write vector a and I want to show symbolically that I mean this is a vector and not just a magnitude, then I put that little arrow symbol above the a. And so likewise, I can just put a little symbol above the i, the j, the k to indicate that this is a vector, but it's not just any vector, it's the very special vector that has an amount of exactly one and lies exactly along an axis. And so instead of the arrow symbol, then we use what we call a hat symbol. I just put a little hat on top of my i or j or k. Of course, it doesn't actually look like a hat, but um, that's what everybody calls it. So I would pronounce that I unit vector, I would pronounce that I hat and J hat and K hat. And so I can also write then, I could write that vector A is equal to, since this lies exactly along the X axis, it's three units long and exactly along the X axis. So it is three times the length of i hat because i hat has a length of one unit. And just so that we're clear, um, if you can't tell with my a being three units long, my b being four units long, just to make these arrows a little bit bigger, um, each box is half. Each box is not one. So I make a two box long. This is an arrow that is exactly along the x axis and has a length of exactly one. The J vector has a length of exactly one, but is along the Y axis. The Z axis, I can't draw on the board right now, but that would be pointing straight outwards from the board, same length as the other two. So I could write vector A as being three times I have because it's three units long rather than one unit long. So three times i hat is vector a, and vector b 
is four units long along the y-axis, so that is four times j hat. I could also say that, I could say if I wanted to be as thorough as possible, I could say that vector a is three units long along the along the x-axis and zero units along the y-axis and zero units along the k-axis. But as a general rule, we just assume if I'm not writing it, then it must be zero. So I could write that vector b is zero i hat plus four j hat plus zero k hat. But it's probably simpler if we just put the non-zero things there, just like we normally so you don't yet see, like, how is this any good? How is this useful for me to rewrite these vectors in this, what we would call unit vector form or component form? But let's look at some more complex vector addition. And we can see how this could be a helpful thing. I've got a few vectors drawn here. Vector A is positive four units in the x direction, negative four units in the y direction. So vector a is four i hat minus four j hat. Now, if I wanted to do a magnitude and direction for vector a, then I could use the Pythagorean theorem and I could calculate that vector a has a length of four radical two at a direction of 45 degrees below the x-axis. Vector B is six units along the positive x direction, three units along the positive y direction. So I would say that vector B is six i hat plus three j hat. If I wanted to know a magnitude and direction for vector B, then uh, I could do radical 36 plus nine. So I could do radical 45 units in a direction of inverse tan of three over six above the x-axis. And if I wanted to, but I don't, if I wanted to, I could do that vector addition, drawing my vector addition diagram, drawing head to tail. And I don't know, I can figure out what this angle is here because I know that I've got a 45 degree angle here. And I know that I've got uh, some angle here that I can calculate. So I could find what this angle is inside. I could use the law of cosines. I could use the law of sines. I could do a bunch of work to figure out whatever this resultant vector is. But I think there's an easier way. Because let's say I want to find uh, vector D that's just A plus B. Well, what I know, actually, I'm going to go back and I'm going to draw this on my grid. Uh, so if I'm adding together, one vector that goes over by four, so I'm adding badly drawn, but there it is. So I'm drawing vector A plus vector B, and vector B goes six units. You know what, I'm going to back up just a little bit and I'm gonna scale this down so that I can fit this. So I'm gonna make each box be one unit long. So vector A, let's say that, is four over and four down plus vector B. And I should have drawn that in green, I'm sorry. So vector A goes four over and four down and vector B goes six to the right and three up. So I can think of this to find my resultant vector here, which I'm going to call vector D, when I add vector A plus vector B. So instead of 
doing a magnitude and direction with the law of sines and the law of cosines, I can recognize that vector a comes down by 4. Also, vector a goes up by 3. I can recognize that vector a goes to the right by 4, and vector b goes to the right by 6. And so I can imagine then, and I'm going to do this in a new color, I'm going to go with purple, hopefully we can distinguish that. So I could reimagine a triangle that has vector d as its hypotenuse, where I know that my total is going over to the right by 4 plus 6, and has a vertical component that goes down 4 and up 3, so I've got a triangle that is 10 units to the right and negative 1 unit along the y-axis. And now I've got a triangle, and I'll put in purple, I'll put that hypotenuse. And so instead of the law of sines and the law of cosines, if I have vector A and vector B in component form, then I can just add together the x components, I can just add together the y components, and then that basically instantly gives me a right triangle. And so I know that the length of vector d is going to be radical 100 plus 1, radical 101, just from using uh, the Pythagorean theorem. And the angle of vector d, I can find this angle up here by taking the inverse tan of 1 tenth, or you could say the inverse tan of negative 1 over 10, uh, if you want to think about what quadrant that vector is in. And so we could do all kinds of fun math with adding and subtracting vectors much, 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 much more quickly. So vector d, if vector d is a plus b, then I just add together the i hat, the x-axis components, and I say that's 10 units along the x-axis plus negative one unit along the j-axis, and there's nothing on the z-axis or if I wanted to do something way more complex, like adding together vector a, 2 times vector a minus vector b plus vector c, I could do that by drawing two a's, now minus b, um, negative b, that's the same as adding negative b, so I could add a vector that goes left 3 down 6, so I could add a vector like this, negative b. Um, we could also think of negative b as having the same length as b, but 180 degrees opposite b, and then add on c, and I could find that. I could find that black resultant vector. I don't know that I've drawn this to scale properly, but this looks like it's going to be a really complex trig unless I use component form. If I use component form, well, 2 times a, I'll just take each axis one at a time. So looking at the i-axis, the, the x-axis, I've got 2 4s minus 6 and vector c has nothing along the x-axis. So I've got 2 times 4 is 8 minus 6. So I've got 2 in the i-hat direction. Now if we look at the uh, y-axis, the j direction, then I've got 2 4s, 2 times a. So along the y-axis, I've got negative 8 minus 3, so negative 8 minus 3 plus c is plus 4, so negative 8 minus 3 plus 4, um, negative 8 minus 3 is negative 11, negative 11 plus 4 is negative 7 along the y-axis, and then plus uh, the 
z-axis, I've got nothing along the z-axis, so we're done. And so we can pretty quickly do that math to find that uh, 2 times vector a minus vector b plus vector c goes 2 units along the positive x-axis and down 7 units along the y-axis. And so the resultant is that arrow that I was trying to draw before. And now it's going to be a whole lot easier to find the magnitude is radical 2 squared plus 7 squared. The magnitude of this vector is radical 4 plus 49. So the magnitude is radical 53. And the direction is inverse tan of 7 over 2. And this is going to be much, much, much easier to do complex math when we are working in component form. So that's why uh, we like it. Uh, that's why it's such a useful thing to do. Um, if we want to do just one more practice with this, um, vector E is going to be A plus B minus C. So looking at the x-axis, the i hats, then I'm doing a, 4, plus b, plus 6, 4, plus 6, minus c is minus 0. So I've got 10 along the i hat direction. Uh, the j hats, I've got negative 4. plus 3, minus 4. So negative 4 plus 3 minus 4 gives me plus 3 along the j-hat direction. And we've got nothing along the k, along the z-axis, so we're done. So vector e, um, adding a and b and then subtracting vector c. Um, subtracting vector c is like adding negative 4j hat um, gives us a nice quick answer. So that's really, really nice. There's one last thing I want to show you about vectors before we're done here. Um, thinking about, let's say the green blob in the center is the sun, and I've got an earth, if you can imagine one of those, moving around in a curvy path. And we know that at any one moment, the direction of the velocity is tangent to that curvy path, uh, represented by the green arrows. The forces are always, the forces on Earth are always towards the sun, represented by my black arrows. And as the Earth moves around the sun, then if we think in terms of x and y components, then the x and y components of the force are always changing. The x and y components of velocity are always changing. Even if we had a perfectly circular orbit where the amount of force isn't changing, the x and y components of the force would always be changing. If it were a perfectly circular orbit, the velocity, um, well, the speed would never be changing, but the velocity would always be changing in terms of changing x and y components and changing direction. So thinking about x, y axes is going to make this problem a two-dimensional problem, like to think about the forces, um, when we don't really need to. Like if I have a perfectly circular orbit where the sun is here at the center, with a perfectly circular orbit, and yes, I know Earth's orbit isn't actually perfectly circular, but I would have, if I use the standard coordinates that we're accustomed to, what we call Cartesian coordinates, where we use x and y components, then let's say the gravitational force is going to have, even if it has the same value, the same length of arrow, the x, y components keep on changing. And so I've got a two-dimensional problem to solve when I really shouldn't need one. On the other hand, if I think about polar coordinates, um, with polar coordinates, I can turn this into a one-dimensional problem. Now, what you're looking at here is graph paper, but it's graph paper like you're not accustomed to. Because with polar coordinates, then like if I wanted to locate this position, 
on the page relative to an origin right here at the center. What you're accustomed to is thinking about x, y components. And we can find the location on the board by measuring how far left, right, and measuring how far vertically. And that can give us the location on the page. But another way that I could identify where on the page is I could use what we call polar coordinates, where I measure out a radius and then an angle. So the radius tells me how far from the center, and the angle tells me how far to go around to find that spot. So I could describe the location of this blue dot that's getting buried here. I could find the location of that blue dot by measuring x, y coordinates like we're used to, or I could measure a distance and then an angle. How far from the center do I go is the r, and how far around in terms of an angle is the theta. And so this is how we could measure the location in polar coordinates. And in terms of polar coordinates, Earth keeps on moving around. The r value hasn't changed, but the theta value has. The r value doesn't change, but the theta does. And so now, where is the Earth um, can turn into a one-dimensional problem because we know that for one of our two axes, we have an unchanging value. And so we can also think in terms of like, say, gravitational forces. Um, if we were going to describe where is the Earth relative to the sun in terms of x, y coordinates, then the gravitational force would be a function of both x and y. But that's overcomplicating things. Uh, we could, by making this be a function in polar coordinates, we know that the gravitational force is not a function of theta, but it is a function of r because the gravitational force is about how far away. So the amount of the gravitational force has nothing to do with theta, has everything to do with r. But if I write in Cartesian coordinates, then it's dependent on both x and y. And that's too hard. And if I want to go to three-dimensional, I want to go three-dimensional, then I could make cylindrical coordinates, where we could imagine uh, this uh, polar grid paper extending out like a big cylinder, where I can measure r and theta, and then I can do a z-axis, like how far out from the board, how far into the board. Or I could use what we call spherical coordinates, which are really useful for astronomers. Spherical coordinates measure uh, one radius and two angles. Here's an example. Uh, if we want to locate where is some star, we could measure an r, a radius, for how far away from us is this star. And we could measure two angles, the angle we call azimuth. We measure if you face north and then turn east, how far do you have to turn from north to east? And then we measure from there an altitude of how far above the horizon do you have to turn to find that star. And so we could describe the location of any one star in the sky in terms of spherical coordinates by measuring one radius and two different angles. So I hope you had fun. Uh, component form using unit vectors is going to be a big deal for us. So thanks for sticking with me.